So let's move on to the 150 Newton force. Here I'm not going to go into as many details that we just did for the 100 Newton force. It's not really necessary. This time I will just refer over to the NCES reference handbook where we can actually pull the general formulas for resolving a force. But I'll tell you right now that my goal is that you don't have to go and reference the manual. That's just going to slow you down. So I want to the reason I define so heavily that last force is because I want you to ingrain that in your mind. All we're doing is using trig identities. We're creating 90 degree um, triangles and we're using our trig identities. That's all that is really needed in these suedo complicated looking problems. So just remember that. You don't have to go back when they say find a force component and search it because it's really just creating a triangle and determining what the lengths of those sides are. All right, so with this force, let's go ahead and start with the X component. What we'll do is do the same thing. We'll pull a line directly north upwards towards that X axis. Now referring back to our NCES reference handbook, it shows us that the formula we need to use to determine this component is f sub x is equal to f cosine theta of x, which is consistent with what we found when we identified each side as adjacent opposite and hypotenuse and referred back to our trig identities. It's the same thing. Now we can move forward with plugging in all the known data with the force being 150 newtons and the angle being 30 degrees. We can just plug it in, right? we have to do anything else? The angle is of 30 degrees is actually referenced back to that 100 Newton force vector. Not all the way back to our X axis. So if we were just to use that angle, then we would obviously get a wrong answer. And I'm telling you right now, the NCES knows that under timed conditions, a lot of pressures arise and that it's very easy to slip up by just looking at a diagram, seeing an angle, knowing you have every all the other data and just plugging it in. Believe me, they're gonna put that answer on the exam. They will. So all we need to do is know that we have the angle of alpha there, still there, back to the x-axis. So to get that complete angle, we need to add 30 to 35 to get an angle of 65 degrees. So that makes the total angle 65 degrees for the 150 Newton uh, force. Now we just need to plug that data into the formula and get 63.4 Newtons. All right, so let's move over to the Y axis component. Again, we just pull horizontally from the tip of the force back to the Y axis. The line of action remains the same. The sense remains the same. So we still know the angle at the origin, which is 65 degrees. And that's from the, from the force 150 back to the X axis. Now referring back to the NCS reference handbook, this is the formula they give us for the Y component. So now what should we do? There's a couple things we can do here. Again, we can go ahead and just find that angle right there, beta, which I denoted in green, kind of lighter green. And we can use that same trig identity that we just used for the X component of the force. Or you can recognize that this length right here in black now, is actually equivalent to that length right there that I highlighted in yellow. So let's clean this up a little bit. We're gonna go ahead and use this angle right here, beta. And actually that formula right there is incorrect. It should be F cosine theta Y because theta Y is beta. 
And if beta is theta y, then that's the adjacent side, which means we're gonna use the cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. So go ahead and just note that as we move through this problem. So let's find beta. To do this, we know this is a right triangle. It's an XY Cartesian coordinate system. That means this is 90 degrees right here. We know this uh, from the force 150 back to the X axis. It's 65 degrees. So all we need to do simply beta is 90 mi minus 65, which is equal to 25 degrees. And now we have beta or theta of y, whatever you want to call it. We have the force. We just have to plug that data in. And as you can see, I actually corrected uh, my mistake, but didn't realize in the first part. So negative 150 times cosine of 25, we get a force of a negative 135.9 Newton. So again, if you see in the upper right corner, I just bag that data into that little table up there because again, we will be referring back to it. All right, let's move over to that 200 Newton force. We won't go into any detail and actually use the first method that I illustrated for the 100 Newton force, tying all the component, components back to the angle that is created between the line of action and the X axis. Now the only thing that we need to do here is make sure that both of our components result in a negative force due to the force acting downward and away from the origin. Remember, it's in that third quadrant. Now here we're given a force of 200 newtons. We have alpha is still 35 degrees. Here's our line of action, there's our sense, that's the direction angle, and I throw that word in there a lot just because sense is such a confusing word. All they need to do is call it the direction angle, but they call it the sense in some case, so I keep uh, reiterating that. So here is each component of our force F. We got Fx up there on the X axis. We got Fy, as you can see I pulled it over from the y axis. And we know to use our trig identities to help us solve for our components. So let's go ahead and reference those once again. And the two identities we are interested in is so and the co of these identities with the x component opposite to our angle and the y component adjacent to our angle. Our formulas will be cosine of alpha is equal to f of sub x divided by f. Our y component will be sine of alpha is equal to f sub y divided by f. Now rearranging both of those to isolate our, each of our components, we have uh, that formula that you see right there. Those two formulas stated on your screen. And taking our data we have an X component of negative 163.8 Newton. We have a Y component of negative 114.7 Newtons. And if you look up there in the upper right corner, we now have all of the data that we need for our hook. So there's all of our data. I brought that table down. Now all we need to do is to to determine the resultant of all of these actions. And to do that, we're actually going to look on page 66 of the statics section in our reference handbook, and we're going to see a resultant force equation that lays out just like that. That's a confusing as, as heck to me. Um, that's the way they choose to display this formula. All this formula is really telling us is to take all of our X components let's, of each of the forces, let's add them up, and then we're gonna square the result. Next, we will take all the Y components, we'll do the same, we'll sum them, we'll square the result. We add both of those values up, both of those squared uh, values, and then we take the square root. 
Now the result will be our resultant force or the net action of the system of forces that we're working with in this particular problem. So let's go ahead and find this result. Now all of our x components and y components add up to our x components, negative 18.5, our y components, negative 308. Both of those are in Newtons. Squaring the result, we're going to get 342.3. We're getting 94,864 for our y components. Now throwing these values, these squared values into our formula, we get something that looks more manageable. We add up the two values and we take the square root and we get 308.6 Newtons. So the magnitude of the force is 308.6 Newtons in the downward direction. But what about the sense? What is the angle that this force is creating with the x-axis? Again, this is going to be our resultant direction. And on page 60, this is a formula that you're seeing right there is on the same page. Page 66 of the NCS reference handbook. Don't know why they use arc tan, that's simply inverse tangent or cotangent, whatever you're, you're familiar with. Now we already have our components sum for each direction. So all we have to do is actually pump those into this formula. And that gives us negative 308 divided by negative 18.5. And when we work it all out, we're going to get an angle of 86.6 .6 degrees. And that's a resultant vector. How do you know which, uh, which way that 86.6 .6 degrees is acting? How come I went from the left to the force vector instead of going the other way? All right, so if we look over at, let's see, over at the sum, and I can't really highlight it because I'm on a presentation. But if you look over at the sum of our X components and our Y components, we have negative 18.5 and negative 308. So that's going to go ahead and put us in the third quadrant because both the FX and the FY component are negative. So when we, in that sense, Knowing what we know about opposite or tangent, opposite over adjacent, the only angle that um, really makes sense or works out is if we took the TOA, the tangent, opposite over adjacent, and that requires a, um, an angle from the force all the way back to the x-axis in the clockwise direction. Now, if we went the other direction, it, it wouldn't work out. The ratio wouldn't work out. So that is how we're going to know it is because both of our components lead our force, our resultant force in that X direction. Also, you can visualize it, um, you know, uh, because of the force in the X component being so small, that uh, force point for our X component isn't going to be much um, very far away from that uh, y-axis, right? Because it's only negative 18.5. Very, very small.